please turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 20, verse 21. Acts chapter 20, verse 21 in the, the church Bibles. It's page 874. I believe, Lord willing, this will be the last of our single verse sermons uh, for the present. But this single verse is certainly worthy of an entire evening's time and attention. Um, here we see the essential response to Paul's message, the, the climax, the focal point. Everything is, is building to this. This is how you have to respond to the gospel message. And as, as we, first as, as we think about how we as individuals in need of the gospel respond to it, we need to make sure we have this right. That as, as we seek to share the gospel with our family, with our friends, with our neighbors, we, we have to make sure that we're giving this correctly also. If you are completely accurate on the entire gospel and you miss this point, then, then you've missed everything. So let's read the text, and let's begin again in verse 18 for the, the context. Paul speaking to the Ephesian elders. And when they came to him, he said to them, You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Before we go any further, will you <clears throat> pray with me? <clears throat> our Lord and our God, the great judge of all the earth, we confess our sins before you this evening. We confess that so many times and in so many ways we have loved the things of the world. We have despised your truth and your beauty. We have, have broken your commandments and run after worthless idols. And we come from a long line of men and women who have hated you and loved the world. Lord, we know that we are by nature children of wrath, that we deserve eternal death, but you love us. You sent your Son into the world to live for us and to die for us and to live again for us. You've brought us eternal life through the gospel of your Son, and you command us to repent and believe. Lord, give us the grace to understand these things and give us the grace to repent and the grace to believe that we might know you that we might know your son and the power of his resurrection that we might know your Holy Spirit and the power of the new birth we ask these things in Jesus name Amen. So here in Acts 20, 21, Paul is summarizing his entire teaching ministry, his not shrinking back from declaring anything that is profitable, his teaching from house to house, and his teaching in public. Not, not that this is the whole content of everything that he taught, but that this, this is what it's all about. This is what everything is for. Testifying both to Jews 
and to Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. So we read last week in, in Mark chapter 1, uh, Mark summarizes Jesus' teaching ministry in the exact same language. Mark 1 verses 14 and 15 he says, now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. When people are convicted of their sins and desire to be saved, the apostles' response to the people is always consistent with this. Um, when, when Paul was in jail in Philippi and released by the power of God and the Philippian jailers is overwhelmed with the truth of this. And he, he, he says to Paul, you know, what must I do to be saved? And, and Paul responds, um, Acts 16.30, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. On the day of Pentecost, as Peter is preaching with, with power, Acts chapter 2, the, the people cry out, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter responds, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's, I'll, I'll confess, in my young Christian life, I was a Calvinist before I was a Christian. Um, and if that doesn't mean anything, that's, that's okay. But I understood from John chapter 3, other places, that you have to be born again. And that it's only by the grace of God that we can come to repent and believe. But being rather ignorant beyond that point, I, I faced this real struggle in, in sharing the gospel because I'd, I'd get to the end of sharing the gospel and, and I mean, what I, you have to be born again. Okay, what does that mean, Nathan? And, well, the Holy Spirit has to do it. And, and you end up in this place where you just kind of feel stuck and you're just sitting here and okay, well, if I can't make myself be born again, and you can't, then just wait for God to do something. But that's, that's not the example we see through the book of Acts. We do it. We must be born again. We must be born again. But the required human response is not wait and hope that you'll be born again. It's repent and believe in the gospel. That's what we have to urge people to do as we share the gospel. Repent and believe. If they, if they do that, then we know that they have been born again. Now, if you're a sharp-eared listener, you might have noticed that in Acts chapter 16, Paul doesn't mention repentance. He just says believe. And in Acts chapter 2, Peter doesn't mention belief. He just says Repent. There's no contradiction between Peter's preaching and Paul's preaching. You know, I mean, Paul himself right here is saying, testifying of repentance and belief. Um, we'll, we'll talk about this a little more later, but we need to understand repentance and faith are inextricably connected to each other. Um, it. Very simple, very common, very good. They're opposite sides of the same coin. You, you can look at heads. You can look at tails. You can see how they're distinct from each other. They're not the same thing. But you can't just take the head side of the coin. The tail side is always going to come with you. So it is with repentance and faith. There, there is no true repentance without true faith. And there's no true faith without true repentance. Again, in a few moments, we'll, we'll look in more detail about what both of those things are. We'll examine both sides of the coin. But there's, there's two things I want to cover before we get to those questions. What is repentance and, and what is faith? The first question we need to see is, is who is repentance and faith for? 
or who needs to repent and believe. We see right here in the text, Paul says, testifying or solemnly testifying to both Jews and to Greeks of repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Both Jews and Greeks need to hear this message. And we shouldn't think that, well, okay, I'm not Jewish, and I'm not Greek. I'm American. Or if we trace my ancestry back somewhat, then, you know, I'm, I'm Irish or German or French or Kenyan or Colombian. Um, but I'm not Jewish, and I'm not Greek. So I guess this isn't for me. Uh, we, we should not think that this is restricted to just those two ethnic groups. In, in the ancient world, especially the Jewish world, the world was divided into two categories. You know, during the Cold War, we had the first world, Western democracy. We had the second world, which was the Soviet Union. And then we had the third world, which were the poor countries not attached to either one. Right? The Jews had a two-world system. There were the Jews, and there was everybody else. You were Goyim, the people, or the Gentiles. And at this time, Greek culture, even though the Roman Empire was a political system, um, the Romans had really adopted very much of Greek culture. So if you weren't Jewish, you were just called Greek. It didn't matter if you are actually from Greece, or from Asia Minor, um, or even from Africa. You weren't Jewish. You're Greek. So, this Jew-Greek connection here, it's absolutely everyone, absolutely everyone, from every place, from every culture, from every socioeconomic background, from, from every lifestyle, everyone needs to hear this message to repent and believe. We make a terrible error if we think that repentance is only for those people, whoever those people might be. We're, we're on the, uh, the last day of Pride Month, and in our society, I mean, just right across the river in St. Louis, there's all sorts of parades and celebrations of sexual immorality. And it's, it's easy to see should be easy to see, that, that they need to repent. It's easy to look at certain cities and certain cultures and, and see the, the prevalence of, of drug abuse and violence and illegitimate elections and, and all these other things. And, I mean, yeah, those people, they need to repent and believe. They need to hear the gospel. And they do. Every, every politician who's supporting the, the murder of infants in the womb needs, and every person who's voting for those politicians needs to repent and believe in the gospel. We should we must call them to repentance and faith without apology, with, without embarrassment or hesitation. But at the same time, we, we need to realize that that nice, polite, hard-working, middle-class, all-American, conservative family who's friendly to their neighbors and, and looks after their neighbor's possessions and, and does well in school and, and works hard every day, they also need to repent and believe for not living lives devoted to loving the Lord their God with all of their heart, soul, mind, and strength. And for, for so many of them, pursuing the American dream as though that were God. Even the church, even Christians who know the law of Christ and love it and strive to follow it, we still need to repent for all of the ways in which we fall short of that law. Martin Luther rightly observed in the very first of his 95 theses, this is what launched the Protestant Reformation in 1517, his, his first argument with the Catholic Church started this way. When our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said repent, 
He willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. When Jesus said repent, he wasn't referring to a one-time action that moves us from death into life. He willed that believers live, that their entire lives be of repentance. Repentance is a necessity for everyone, Jew and Greek, rich and poor, black and white, Christian and pagan. No one is saved without repentance, and no one who is saved ever stops repenting until we are perfected in Jesus Christ. So as we call others to repent and believe, we must preach the same truth to ourselves. In, in Mark chapter 2, in our scripture reading this morning, the Pharisees criticized Jesus for eating with tax collectors and sinners. And Jesus responded, those who are sick have no need of, those who are healthy have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. And, and so often we want to use that, or our society wants to use that as well, see, Jesus is hanging out with these ungodly people, so I need to go hang out with those ungodly people. When what we need to realize is we are those sinners. The Pharisees aren't righteous. They're sick. They're sinners. They need the grace of Jesus Christ, and so do we. We must repent and believe. Second question is just building on this first one. Why does everyone need to repent and believe? The answer is very simple. Romans 3.23 All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Sin is, is simply defined as any transgression against or lack of conformity to the will of God. So in, in the Bible study this morning, in the book of James, James 4.17, For whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Anytime God has told you to do something through His Word, and you've failed to do it, you've sinned. Anytime God has said not to do something, in His Word. These are the ones we, we focus on more. Do not murder, do not steal, do not commit adultery, do not bear false witness. Anytime we do any of those things, we sin. And some people can even argue with, with apparent sincerity that, well, I haven't sinned. I haven't committed adultery. I haven't stolen anything. I haven't murdered anyone. I haven't lied about my neighbor, at least not you know, as a witness in a court of law. And, and they can, again, sincerely say, well, no, I haven't done any of those things. One, with a, with a right understanding of the breadth of these commandments, I think we'll find that we have broken them. But even without establishing that point, Jesus summarized the law of God, Mark 12, 30, and 31. It's also repeated in Matthew and in Luke. The greatest commandment is this. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your mind and with all of your soul and with all of your strength. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. He's, they're quoting Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 and 5, and Leviticus 19, 18. If we take that seriously, then it should be very evident to us that we are constantly failing to do what God has commanded of us. We love God sincerely as Christians. We love Him deeply. But we don't love Him as He deserves to be loved. We, probably less than we love God, because 
they're not as lovable. We strive to love our neighbors. We want to do good to them. And we can be pretty successful at not actively sinning against them. But we don't love them like we love ourselves. And we can't excuse it just by saying, that, well, that's impossible. We can't excuse it by saying, well, nobody does that. It's, it's what God commands and it's what God deserves. And because we're not doing it, we rightly deserve the wrath of God forever and ever. It is sin. We know what we should do, and we're not doing it. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. Therefore, we must repent and repent and repent. The, the unbeliever needs to repent of whatever external sins they are guilty of. They need to repent of having a heart and a mind that has for so long rejected God's truth and His goodness and His authority. But the Christian also must repent of whatever external sins they are guilty of and of not loving God and their neighbors enough. James 3, 2 says it very, very plainly. We all stumble in various ways. We must repent of all those ways that we stumble. The entire life of believers is to be one of repentance. Repentance doesn't earn us God's favor. Repentance doesn't earn us a place in heaven. But it does allow us to receive God's grace. Because of our sins, we deserve God's wrath, His anger, His fury. But He's provided a way of salvation for us through His Son, Jesus Christ. God became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. Glory as of the only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. He, and He only, perfectly fulfilled the law of God. He's the only person who, who could ever say, I have loved the Lord my God, my Father, with all of my heart and soul and mind and strength. He and He only could say, I have loved my neighbor as myself. He and He only perfectly fulfilled the law of God down to the smallest jot and tittle. He dotted every I and crossed every T. And because of that, because of His love for the Father and His love for His neighbor, the world hated Him. And they seized Him, crucified Him. But on the cross, Jesus took upon Himself the sins of all those who would ever repent of them and, and put their trust in Him. He bore the penalty for those sins. He suffered in our place and He died and was buried and on the third day rose again. The payment had been made. The punishment was sufficient. The sacrifice was accepted. And now He lives forever and He gives eternal life to everyone who will believe in Him. John 3 proclaims this truth three times in, in the one chapter. It's, it's all right there. And we're, we're all familiar with John 3.16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. 
But it's repeated just two verses later, John 3, 18. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And then it's repeated again, John 3, 36. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. This is where you stand. On your own, you are already condemned for your sins. You can't argue that others were worse. You can't argue that you had extenuating circumstances. You can't argue that it wasn't really that bad. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God remains on him. It's not going to come upon you if you don't repent and believe. It's going to remain on you because you're already under his wrath. You have no hope of appeal. There's no technicality that can get you off. You stand surely and rightly condemned to hellfire forever. But the same judge who condemns you offers you pardon and peace and eternal life if you will but repent and believe. It's the only way of escape. It's what you must do to be saved. Repent and believe. So it's absolutely essential that we understand what is it to repent and what is it to believe. So we'll start with repentance. The word literally means to change your mind, to think differently. It certainly includes that, but we, we, we can't stop there. It includes how we think. It requires that we think differently, but it, it also has to be a change in our heart and our actions as well. In the Puritan Catechism put together by Charles Spurgeon, I think it answers the question well. It says, Repentance unto life is a saving grace whereby a sinner, out of a true sense of his sins, and apprehension of the mercy of God in Christ, does with grief and hatred of his sin turn from it to God, with full purpose to strive after new obedience. I think that's good enough to repeat, so I'm going to. Repentance unto life is a saving grace whereby a sinner, out of a true sense of his sins and apprehension of the mercy of God in Christ, does with grief and hatred turn from his sin to God, with full purpose to strive after new obedience. We change our mind, we change our attitude, we change our direction. True repentance starts with a true sense of our sins. We don't dismiss it anymore. We're not going to minimize it. We're not going to say, it's not a big deal. We're not going to say, well, everybody else does it. We're not going to say, it's my parents' fault. It's my husband's fault. It's my wife's fault. It's that other driver's on the road's fault. It's my boss's fault. It, it is absolutely true that everybody else around you is also sinning. But that doesn't excuse your sin. Your sin is a violation of God's law. Your sin is a rebellion against the God who created the universe and everything in it. The God who created you and sustains your life moment by moment. Against the God who created and gave us good and perfect laws. And through sin, we hate Him and we break His laws and we pursue evil things instead. Do you truly believe? Do you truly feel in your heart 
that God would be right to send you to hell because of what you have done against Him. If, if you don't, then you haven't repented. You are not saved. This, this awareness of our guilt, of, of the sinfulness of sin. Paul says the law came that sin might become sinful beyond measure. This mere awareness of the sinfulness of sin isn't repentance in itself. It's, it's a necessary part of it, this true sense of our sins. But we also have to apprehend the mercy of God in Christ. To, to apprehend, the only time we really use that in, in modern English is, you know, police have apprehended a suspect. They've caught him. They've seized him. They have him now. To, to comprehend or to understand it. I, we, we've seized hold of this. I'm not going to let go of this. I understand that there is mercy for me in Jesus Christ. And I'm going to cling to that mercy. Because it is my only hope for salvation. Just understand that even though I am a sinner, God loves me. That He sent His Son into the world, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. To realize that He sent His Holy Spirit into the world to minister to us, to bring us to this, this faith and repentance. To understand that mercy and forgiveness are available for me. Some people fail to reach repentance because they do not understand their guilt. They think, I don't need a Savior. Others fail to reach repentance because they do not understand the mercy of God. They do not understand or believe that there is a Savior. Both are errors. To repent, we have to understand both our guilt and God's mercy and repent unto life. Now, so what, what happens once we understand these two truths? We still haven't repented yet, but now we understand what's necessary for repentance to take place. We, we repent when we turn with grief and hatred from our sin unto God or toward God with full purpose to strive after new obedience. So we determine, to the very best of our ability, dependent upon the help of the Holy Spirit, that I'm going to stop sinning. We're going to say, I don't love my sin anymore. I want to obey God's laws. I want to love my wife. I want to honor my parents. I want to love my neighbors. I want to love the Lord my God with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength. I don't want to commit adultery. I don't want to steal. I don't want to covet. I want God and I want His righteousness. I want to obey His law. I want to obey His will because they are good. Not because they're the laws I have to follow to stay out of trouble, but because they are good. And there's still sin that dwells in our flesh. And we still stumble in many ways. And there's still moments when, when my heart feels that there's something wrong with God's law. But I recognize that when there's a conflict between God's law and my heart, the problem's in my heart. The, the problem is not in God's law. So I'm going to strive after new obedience. I'm going to work hard to be obedient. I hate these sins that I used to love. I weep over these sins that I used to love. I'm going to take whatever steps are necessary to reach the fullest obedience I, I can possibly achieve. That's repentance. It defines the Christian life, both as we enter into it and as we walk with Christ. 
Have you repented of your sin? Are you repenting of your sin? I, I think I referenced this just a few weeks ago. I'm, I'm going to do it again. Uh, the movie Fireproof with, with Kirk Cameron. Um, the beginning of the movie, Kirk Cameron is not loving his wife very well. He's a successful firefighter. He feels like he just deserves everything and his wife isn't giving him enough time and attention and, and he's finding satisfaction, trying to find satisfaction through his computer instead of through his wife. And throughout at the beginning of the movie, he, I mean, he knows this is wrong and he shouldn't be doing it and he doesn't want to be caught. But he's still keeping that computer. And then, the, the turning point in the movie, when he really repents of his sin, is when he takes the computer out of the house, and he brings out his baseball bat, and he smashes it to pieces. And his neighbor across the, just looks at him like he's crazy. But... That's, that's repentance. There's so many people, so many young men caught in sin because they have constant access to the internet. And well, I can't, I can't give up my smartphone. We've lived for nearly 6,000 years as a human race without smartphones. You can live without a smartphone. If you need a smartphone for your job, you can get another job if you can't stop sinning with this phone. Jesus said, if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better to enter life blind and crippled and maimed than with both hands and both feet and, and both eyes to go to hell. better. It's better with no smartphone or with no internet connection or whatever, with, with no sports, with with no swimming pools, with whatever, whatever is causing you to sin. We all sin in many different ways. But are we willing to do whatever it takes to fight against those sins? It's repentance. As a, as a mental picture, maybe to help us remember what repentance is, um, Sam Waldron um, presented to me this analogy of a tree. And he was very clear that he didn't come up with it himself, but he didn't tell me who he got it from. So I can only attribute it to Sam Waldron. Um, think, of, think of a tree. Underground, out of sight, but completely essential for the health and, and growth of the tree. We, we have the root system. That the roots aren't the tree, but it's a part of the tree, and, and it's, it's how the tree lives. Right? So the roots of repentance are, are this changed sense of our sins and of God's mercy. This, this awareness of the truth. We, we need to have that so that we can and, and then once those roots are there, then the trunk grows from the roots. The, the trunk of repentance is the changed heart and mind towards sin and, and towards God. So I've realized this is sinful, this is evil. I've realized there is mercy in God, that's the roots. Now my heart loves God's law now instead of those sins. My mind thinks that God's law is good and my actions are, are evil. And then out of, out of the trunk, um, we have the branches with leaves and, and bearing fruit, and the fruit of repentance, the works of 
repentance is it's a fruit of the Spirit. It's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. It's the external works which spring from them. We're going to live differently. We're going to bear fruit in keeping with repentance. So, it helps me remember different aspects of repentance. And maybe it will do so for you as well. Final question for tonight. We've seen what is repentance. What is faith? What does it mean to have faith in our Lord Jesus Christ? Uh, the, the same Puritan catechism I mentioned earlier, it answers that question as well. Faith in Jesus Christ is a saving grace whereby we receive and rest upon Him alone for salvation as He is set forth in the Gospel. Faith in Jesus Christ is a saving grace whereby we receive and rest upon Him alone for salvation as He is set forth in the Gospel. There, there's, there's almost a danger in, in saying we're saved by faith alone. It's, it's, it's completely true to say we're saved by faith or through faith alone. But our, our society can twist so many things. That it makes faith itself a virtue. If we, if we want to be more accurate, we're not saved by faith alone. We're saved by faith in Jesus Christ alone. Our society doesn't have any problem with faith. Our society actively encourages faith in all sorts of things. You need to believe in yourself. You need to believe scientists. You need to believe the mainstream media, not the alternative media, the mainstream media. You need to believe in both political parties. You need to be, believe in our party and don't trust that party. They're all liars and hypocrites. And they both say that about each other. We probably shouldn't believe either one of them. Uh, you need to believe in your dreams. You need to believe something. Just don't believe in Jesus Christ. That's what our world says. Uh, such a faith as the world promotes will do us no good. Faith, in its essence, is, is simply trust. And if you trust in something untrustworthy, you will be disappointed. Faith in the wrong things, the wrong people, will not help you. But Christ is completely trustworthy. And His gospel is completely trustworthy. And so to believe in Him, to have faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ, is, is just to trust Him. Not to give him a chance and wait and see if this works out. That's the way we deal with people all the time. And, and generally, that's a good idea. If you, you hire a contractor to do work for you, it's really not a good idea to pay him everything up front. Because I don't have any percentages for this, but... A lot of times, yeah, they'll, they'll still do all the work. But sometimes, once you pay them, they'll just disappear. Not so with Jesus Christ. We, we just said that, I, I, I love the song, Coming Center, so much. It kills me when I see hymnals that cut off the last two verses. Lo, the incarnate God ascended, pleads the merit of His blood. Venture on Him, venture holy. Let no other trust intrude. Venture on Him, step upon Him, cast yourself upon Him. 
Cling to Him and, and abandon your efforts to save yourself. Faith is, Hebrews 11.1, 1, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. It, it's, it's being convinced that God is going to keep His Word. We haven't yet seen the full salvation of the Lord. But we are certain that it is coming. We, we receive and we rest upon Christ alone for our salvation. We believe that the Bible is speaking the truth when it tells us of salvation through Jesus Christ. We believe that God is really offering salvation to me and to you now. We trust the promise and we, we rest in it. We believe and we repent. And so, so often, again, because we've, we've separated faith from faith in Jesus Christ, we, we can worry about, do I believe sincerely enough? Do I believe deeply enough? Such a question, it's, it's misunderstanding the very nature of, of faith and of our assurance. Faith isn't about the person believing, it's about the object of our belief. Are you trusting in Christ? Are you resting in Christ or, or are you not? There, there's no... There's not a sliding scale that you have to have to reach this one point. You know, okay, now you've tripped over and you believe enough. You either believe or you don't believe. Are you trusting Jesus or, or are you trusting yourself? Or are you trusting a, a false Jesus that's been made up by your own desires, a culturally con correct conception of him? Another mental picture that I've found helpful, and, and I hope you do. We, we can think of trusting in Jesus the same way that the, we trust a chair when we sit in it. Through faith, we, we rest in Christ, much as we would rest in a chair that we trust. When I'm at my house, I'm in my living room, I, I don't think about the chairs that I'm sitting on. I've sat in all of them. They all bear my weight. And, and so when I'm tired, I just go and sit. Um, but if, if I'm at someone else's house, we have these, you know, maybe these, you know, thin, spindly, wooden chairs. I'm, I'm heavier than the average person. Um, and I have to think, you know, well, is, is this chair going to Support me. Um, I don't want to just, you know, collapse into the chair, um, throw all my weight upon it. It, it might break. Um, there have been some chairs that I've been absolutely certain if I settle my weight upon there, they're going to, to break. So I don't trust these chairs. And in that case, you know, maybe I'll, I'll just, no, I'll, I'll stand. Or, this is more dangerous to us as Christians, you know, well, I don't want to hurt their feelings, so I'll kind of pretend to sit upon it, and I'll put, you know, like a quarter of my weight on it, but really all of my weight's on this foot, so I don't want to break the chair, and if it does break, I want to make sure that I have enough weight and balance to where I'm not going to fall down. And if you've ever done that, um, you know, that's quite a bit more exhausting than just standing. But so often, that's, that's a lack of faith in the chair. And we can have that same lack of faith in Jesus Christ. Where, okay, yeah, he, he offers to save us. And, and maybe he will. But the only person I can really trust is, is myself. So, I'll, I'll stand over here and, and I'll put a little bit of my weight on it. But I've got to make sure that I'm ready to, to catch myself. And we're receiving no rest from Him. We're, we're not receiving Him. We're not trusting Him. We, we need to 
entrust ourselves to the salvation of Jesus Christ, to, to settle our weight upon it, to pick our feet up off the floor, to lean our backs against the chair. That's the other thing we do with chairs. We're, we're worried about the back breaking, so you know, we'll sit straight upright and not lean into the, the backrest. We can settle our weight upon Jesus Christ. We can be completely confident that, that He will not collapse under us. He will not lose His grip on us. He will not fail to save us. We will not be left to try to save ourselves. He is our strong and sure deliverer, the steadfast anchor of our souls. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. He will never fail us. He is worthy of our faith. Are you resting in Him? If you're resting in anything else, your own works, your own ideas, some other system of the world, your faith is going to fail you. It will lead you into ruin and destruction. But if your faith is in Christ, He will bear you up and bring you safely into heaven. Put your faith in Christ and in none other. So, whether we're preaching the gospel to ourselves, we should be regularly, or if we're preaching the gospel to our neighbors, and we should be regularly, we should always end with this same call. Repent from your sins. Repent toward God and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. When you are examining yourselves, when you're counseling others, this has to be the question. Not, not have you repented of your sins? Not have you believed in the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you repenting of your sin? Are you believing in the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you turning with grief and hatred from your sins unto God, determined to strive after your obedience? Are you receiving and resting in Jesus Christ for your salvation as He is set forth in Scripture? Are you? Repent and believe. Let's pray together. Father, where else can we go? You give the words of eternal life. We know ourselves to be like that paralytic man in Mark chapter 2. We cannot walk. We cannot come to you. We cannot stop sinning. Give us your grace. Lord, help our unbelief. Cause us to see the reality of our sin and our guilt. But Lord, don't abandon us to such despair. Cause us also to see the grace and the mercy of salvation through your Son, Jesus Christ. Cause us to preach the gospel without flinching to ourselves and to all those around us. And 
help us to repent and believe and to keep repenting and to keep believing. That we might be saved, that our loved ones might be saved, and that you might be glorified. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.